The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Artificial intelligence apps respond to complicated questions quickly and in ways that sound just like a human. Tonight, why that's convinced some very smart people that AI might be slightly conscious or on the cusp of sentience. And if that's not jaw-dropping enough, we'll also speak to author Dacker Keltner about his new book on the science of how to find happiness through awe. It's Tuesday, February 14th, and that's all next on The Agenda. Perhaps it was inevitable that we'd find ourselves asking, has artificial intelligence advanced to the point of being sentient? With millions of people interacting daily via apps such as ChatGPT and now Google's Bard, to name a couple, these AIs certainly interact in ways eerily similar to humans. With us now on just how close we are to potentially conscious computers. Let's welcome, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Melanie Mitchell, professor at the Santa Fe Institute and author of Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. In Waco, Texas, Robert J. Marks, distinguished professor at Baylor University and author of Non-Computable You, What You Do That Artificial Intelligence Never Will. And in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Max Tegmark, professor of physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and co-founder of the Future of Life Institute. He's also author of Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And it's great to have so much expertise on this uh, very newfangled subject on our program tonight. We're going to start with a few quotes and a few bullet points as well, just to set up the discussion to come. So here we go. Last February, the chief scientist at OpenAI, that's the company, of course, that created ChatGPT, said today's technology might be, quote, slightly conscious. The CEO of OpenAI said it is like an alien form of intelligence, but it still counts. In June, Google engineer Blake Lemoyne made waves when he claimed their AI, known as Lambda, was sentient. He was later fired for going public with his views. And Google recently unveiled BARD, which is their rival to ChatGPT. So let's get going here. Melanie, how about to you first? To what extent does ChatGPT or BARD understand and know what it is saying? The word understand is not uh, universally agreed on what it means, but I think it's very clear that these systems do not understand language or the world in the way that we humans do. You know, their job is to predict the next word in a text to produce plausible uh, language following a prompt, but they don't have any connection to the real world beyond language. So they don't really understand in the sense that we do what the world is and how it works. Max, can I get you on that? Do they understand? Do they know? I agree with Melanie that you know, we've got to be really careful with what we mean and understand by the word understand. You know, I think intelligence is something quite different from from consciousness and sentience. Intelligence means Amen. you have an ability to accomplish cool stuff and impress people on the internet and drive cars. Consciousness, sentience means that you have an experience of things. I'm right now subjectively experiencing colors and emotions and sounds. And I, I would guess that today's uh, best AI systems don't experience much, but we have to be humble and, and acknowledge that we don't know that for sure. And we have a very bad track record as a species of mistreating animals and slaves and others and dismissing that they could ever feel anything negative just because it was convenient, you know, if you... Um... So um, this is something we absolutely have to understand better. Understood. Okay, Robert, let's go to you on that claim made by the engineer from Google who said that he thought Google's AI was sentient. What do you make of that claim? 
Well, I debated Blake Lemoyne at a recent uh, COSM conference, and um, he indeed believes that Lambda is is, is indeed sentient. I mean, he um, he uh, he got Lambda a lawyer. He got afraid at one time and made a suggestion that maybe they should have an exorcism. So he uh, he, he truly believes in in this sentient stuff. Addressing the idea of understanding, I think that this was put to bed uh, 40 years ago by John Searle. John Searle was a great philosopher, and he talked about Searle's Chinese room. And it's a compelling illustration that computers will never understand what they are doing. That includes these large language models. Searle said, imagine a room where questions and answers are stored on cards in a bunch of file cabinets. And in that room is slipped little questions in Chinese through a little slot in the door. Searle is in the room. Now, he doesn't understand Chinese. He can't write Chinese. He doesn't read Chinese. But he looks at this little slip of paper, and he starts going through the file cabinets until he finds a match. Now, in in the in the file cabinets are are little cards which have the um, which have the answer to the question. So Cyril chop copies that down and slips it back through the door. Uh, Cyril's Chinese room illustrates that from the outside, it sure looks what uh, is on the inside, understands what is going on. But no, Cyril, who is doing this algorithmic step by step procedure, has no understanding of Chinese at all. Now today's large language models are much more complex than simply looking things up. But the but the premise applies. It's just a, a bunch of algorithm um, algorithms being applied to um, to simulate, if you will, uh, understanding. But the software itself has no understanding. It not, uh, computers can add the number twenty three and fifteen, but it doesn't understand what the number twenty three or the number fifteen is. And AI has no more understanding what it does than your cell phone understands the podcast you listen to. Melanie, what do you make of those analogies? So I can't agree completely because I think understanding is really um, a, a continuum. And I don't see any difference really between um, uh, our, our understanding and a potential machine understanding if it's created in the same way that we are, you know, raised in a culture, uh, brought up in the real world and so on. So I think there's in principle, machines could understand because I believe that we are in a sense, essence machines ourselves. But I agree with Robert that, that it's today's language models don't understand much, that they're locked in the world of language and the world of language in and of itself, without any connection to the real world, is not going to produce the kind of understanding that we usually talk about and that we really need for robust and reliable AI systems. Max, I'm going to read an exchange here. This is between Blake Lemoyne and Google's AI Lambda. And then I'll get you to comment on this exchange. And again, I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up this graphic here. Here's Lambda, happy, contentment, and joy feel more like a warm glow on the inside. Sadness, depression, anger, and stress feel much more heavy and weighed down. To which Lemoyne responds, do you think the things you are describing are literally the same thing as what humans feel, or are you being somewhat metaphorical and making an analogy? Lambda, I understand what a human emotion joy is because I have that same type of reaction. It's not an analogy. Lambda would go on to describe being afraid of being turned off. And then here's what Lemoyne had to say about his interactions with Lambda. Quote, I know a person when I talk to it, it doesn't matter whether they have a brain made of meat in their head or if they have a billion lines of code. I talk to them and I hear what they have to say and that is how I decide what is and isn't a person. Max, can you react to that? Yeah, so I have sympathy for both sides of this argument actually of, of course if someone is telling you something you you have a tendency to if it's a human figure well they're kind of like me so this probably is real but if a tape recorder tells you that exactly those words you would not conclude that they're conscious you wouldn't even say it's lying to you it's just a tape recorder so i, I agree with uh, robert that you you cannot answer these questions just from looking at the behavior of the machine. You have to understand what's inside. But I also 
agree with Melanie here. I, that uh, I, I think uh, Robert went a little far when he categorically dismissed that machines can understand or, or be conscious because, frankly, yeah, I am a blob of quarks and electrons that are processing information in a certain way, and, and so are all these AI systems. And I think it's carbon chauvinism to assume that somehow you can only have true understanding or in sentience if you're made of carbon. I think what we've learned is that actually it's it doesn't matter whether you're made of carbon or silicon or some other kind of atom. It's it's just the information processing that matters. Robert, and you want to take another shot at shutting this do, down? So can machines. Uh, uh, yeah, sure can. We talked we talked about um, first of all creativity and um, computers. I, I believe if you if you look at them right or ha don't have the ability to be creative, uh, what what Lemoyne is doing is judging a book by its cover. This follows the, the idea that Max is talking. One needs to look under the hood to see what's happening. And one of the great tests for, for creativity was proposed by Summer Bringshort at Rensselaer, which says that a computer will be creative when it uh, does something that is beyond the explanation or the intent of the original programmer. I maintain that GPT, which was recently labeled by Noam Chomsky as high-tech uh, plagiarism uh, is is not indeed creative. It's synthesizing a bunch of a bunch of stuff. And uh, often I've gotten answers from GPT-3. And if you Google some of the great responses that it has, um, you find out that, yeah, it's it, it's on the web. So it borrowed it from somewhere. So um, I don't believe and this is an arguable point, but I don't believe there's any case of a computer or AI passing the Lovelace test and demonstrating that it is truly creative like a human can be. Well, Melanie, let's try this. If an artificial intelligence were actually conscious, how would we know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's any good test that will tell you if something is conscious or not. You know, that's, as Max said earlier, you know, we've argued for millennia as to whether animals are conscious or even certain, um, you know, plants or other structures. And, you know, and we, no one agrees on whether these things are conscious. We don't have a rigorous test. But I think that we all probably agree that consciousness does require the notion of experience. It requires the notion of having a sense of yourself, that you have kind of a model in your brain of that you that that you are an entity, that you have feelings, that you have emotions, that there is a you there. And we know that language models like Chat GPT or GPT-3 or Lambda don't have that. They don't have that kind of model of themselves as an entity. They don't have experiences. They are computing probabilities over the next words or phrases in language. So I think we can very confidently say that these systems are not conscious, but we don't have a rigorous test to sort of prove that. And that's been a philosophical argument for forever, you know, since the early days uh, when people even started thinking about consciousness. In which case, Robert, what would you need to see to be convinced that there was some sentience or consciousness in artificial intelligence? Well, let's go. Let's go back to the definition. You know, we uh, we really even haven't defined consciousness. I think we've agreed it's difficult to define. Currently, there's a number of different models of, of consciousness. One is panpsychism, which says that everything in the universe is conscious to a degree, and we just looked out because we got our lion's share of consciousness. There's this idea of emergence that if you get enough complexity that all of a sudden, boom, that this consciousness is going to appear. Um, I, I having, having played around a lot with emergence, I don't believe that that's possible. Uh, Tononi at the University of Wisconsin has, has proposed a model called integrated information theory about consciousness. The two that do have credence, the first one, I'm sure he wasn't the first one, to propose this, but it was Roger Penrose in his great book, a, um, The Emperor's New Mind, proposed that our consciousness cannot be algorithmic. Therefore, it cannot come from a silicon computer. 
his proposal was that it had to come from quantum effects, not quantum computing, but quantum effects, because that was the only non-algorithmic thing that he could think of which could explain consciousness. Um, the other possibility, which has been debated since, well, Descartes and way beyond that, is the so-called mind-body problem. Are we computers made out of meat? The mind-body problem and the philosophy of mind uh, explores the idea whether the mind is disjoint or separated uh, some way from the body. And we do have some growing evidence that indeed that is the case. All right, Max, can I get you to respond as to whether or not consciousness from a computer ever would be possible? I think I think it's absolutely possible, and it's interesting. We've talked mostly about whether today's systems are conscious or, or not, and whether they understand or not. But I think it's very clear, regardless of that, that future systems absolutely will be able to do everything we want. And I find it kind of nutty, actually, and reckless that humanity is just forging ahead, building these ever more powerful systems uh, without even really um, <laughs> thinking too much about the, the, the implications. I think there's a 50% chance that within my lifetime, you know, machines that we have ultimately built will kill all humans. And, and, and why are we not um, talking more about it at this stage? Well, as long as we're putting percentages out there, Melanie, I note that you had an online discussion with a so-called philosopher of consciousness, David Chalmers, and he gave AI a 20% chance of consciousness in 10 years. What do you think of that claim? Uh, I don't think you can put percentages on it. And I think David Chalmers really agrees with that, that he was, you know, he sort of doing it kind of just to give a number. There's no way to calculate the probability of this. We really don't even understand our own consciousness very well, even though there are, as Robert said, theories of consciousness, but nobody agrees on what it is, how to explain it, how it works in the brain. And until we understand our own consciousness, our own intelligence better, I don't think we can really put any kind of percentage on achieving it in a certain number of years in machines. So I would say that, that those kinds of claims are... are really take them with a big grain of salt. Well, Robert, I need to ask you about one of your more colorful characterizations of the possibility of consciousness here. You've compared yeah. those who believe that AI consciousness is possible to a naive young boy standing in front of a pile of horse manure. You want to explain what you meant by that? <laughs> sure. Well, this this gets back to the list that I made of the different um, different uh, models of consciousness. This model of consciousness believes that there's going to be an emergence. That is, as the complexity of computers gets greater and greater and greater, there's going to be a gradual emergence of, of, of a consciousness. And the story goes back to... Um, yeah, this, this is kind of a lay story, if you will. But a little boy that's in a room with horse manure, and he's he's all happy. He's taking the manure, and he's throwing it behind his back, and he's excited. And somebody asks him, what are you doing? And he says, well, with all of this all of this uh, horse manure, there must be a pony in here somewhere. And I think that that's very similar to what's happening with this emergence sort of behavior. With all this complexity, like Tononi's model and some of these other emergence models, there must be some consciousness in here somewhere. I, need, I see no evidence of that, and um, so that's my story. I remember when Ronald Reagan told that joke about 45 years ago, and he got a good laugh he from did. it, too. Yes, he did. <laughs> okay. okay, having said that, Max, you have an expression here. You think uh, many people are suffering from carbon chauvinism. What do you mean by that? I mean, we pat ourselves on the head and tell ourselves that we're so special because we're, we're made of carbon atoms. And, and I think you know, the, the honest truth is we need to be more humble and uh, acknowledge that our intelligence and our consciousness has to do with information being processed in certain ways. And there's no reason whatsoever that machines can't when they do that. And I think uh, even though it's true that we don't understand enough about consciousness, and we shouldn't trust percentages. I think um, that should not lull us into a false sense of security and think that machines can't wipe us out just because they're not conscious. You know, if you're chased by a heat-seeking missile, you don't care if it's conscious or not. You, you don't care about this question of whether it's what it feels or whether it feels like anything to be a heat-seeking missile. You just care about its behavior, right? And it's perfectly plausible that we could build such powerful machines 
in our lifetime that they would wipe out humanity without being conscious. And in some ways, if they did that, that would be even worse than if we were wiped out by conscious machines, at least if, the, if our descendants on this planet are conscious and are having all sorts of cool experiences, you could maybe feel a little bit better about it, thinking, thinking of them as our ancestors. Maybe they have some of our values and will enjoy the next billions of years. But if we just replace humanity by a bunch of unconscious zombies, I mean, isn't that the most pathetic ending to humanity you could imagine? You know, the ultimate zombie apocalypse where the rest of our great potential here in the universe is just a, a play for empty benches with no one experiencing anything, no joy, nothing. Okay, when Max said this a few moments ago about the, the possibility that machines uh, have a 50% chance of wiping us all out uh, during the course of his lifetime, I did let it go then, but he's come back to it, so we gotta go there now. Melanie, what do you think of that claim? Um, I don't think it's the machines who are gonna wipe us out per se. I think it's, um, I don't know about the 50%, that seems overly pessimistic to me, but I do think the biggest danger comes from humans misusing these machines, not the machines getting out of control and wiping us out. I think that um, we tend to overestimate the probability of machines becoming overly intelligent and underestimate the probability of humans misusing them. And there's so many ways in which these machines can be misused to um, harm us, either, as Max might say, using them in some kind of military uh, situation in a war, or even more prosaically to um, harm people through uh, civil rights kind of violations with their biases, or harm them with misinformation that they spread on the web that, you know, humans use them to spread on the web. So I would say humans, as usual, in, in these technologies mm -hmm. are the real problem, not the machines themselves. Robert, you want to take a kick at that prediction? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let, let me just comment on, on the flavor of the questions and the answers. I believe that the large language models that we're talking about today are just a tempest in a teapot. Other people have made prophecies. Here's my prophecy. And this has delayed scrutiny, like uh, it's going to be 10 years down the road, 40 years down the road. In 10 years or 40 years, nobody's going to care that we made that we made this forecast. But here, here is my prophecy. In a few years, we will adapt to large language models like we have adapted to other adapted to other technology like deep fakes, computer viruses, uh, email spam, and industrial robots. We only have to look at history to see a pattern of this. I'm old enough to remember the Y2K bug. It was totally going to destroy the world. No, it didn't. Deep fakes a few years ago were going to totally destroy politics. We were going to see deep fakes all over the place disrupting things. Even open open AI, when they released GPT, two said, oh my gosh, this is just too dangerous of stuff. We're not going to release it because it could be used for Twitter accounts for fake news. Um, Self-driving cars a few years ago, everybody was afraid it was going to just disrupt society by taking over all of the truck driver jobs and a number of the service industries. And that, you know, that that's something that we've adopt, adapted to. So I think, again, this is this is a lot of this is just a tempest in a teapot. It's exciting to talk about. It's exciting to talk about speculations. But we're discovering more and more limitations of these large language models. And we have to remember, and I think this this build on what Melanie said is that is that AI is a tool. And the question is, how do we use it safely and how do we use it effectively? And that's going to be that's going to be an answer for the future as it begins to meld and become a part of our society. Max, has Robert managed to uh, convince you not to be so negative or pessimistic about the future yet? <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of positive hopes as well, but <clears throat> To realize those dreams, of course, we need to not screw up. I I, um, I agree strongly with Melanie that you know, if you're not worried about machines themselves taking over and wiping us out, just spend a moment thinking about your least favorite leader on the planet and imagine that they are the first to have control over the super intelligence and impose their will on the world. You know, that's that's concern enough. And I, I think I think uh, we uh, we need to ask ourselves, why is it that we are forging ahead, building all these ever more complicated AI models that we don't even fully understand when we don't do that with other stuff like human cloning. You know, wouldn't it be cool to just make 10,000 clones of Wayne Gretzky 
so <laughs> every little high school in Canada could have better hockey games. Why have we banned that or taken a time out on it? Because we realize that this is a very powerful technology. We don't fully understand the implications. So we're like, okay, let's cool it a little bit, think it over. Uh, whereas with AI, it's just full steam ahead. And you know, even even aside from uh, the, the possibility that uh, we'll get an Orwellian dystopia where your least favorite leader sort of took over the planet with AI or lost maybe lost control over it and 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 we all died. Even aside from that, just look at what's happening now. The kettle and the teapot, these large language models. You know, what are we doing with them? What exactly that's supposed to be so great? Before we were told that we were going to use AI and robots to eliminate the dangerous jobs, the boring jobs. The people, I'm all for that. But but now, if you play with ChatGPT, you can see that they can actually eliminate poets' jobs, artists' <laughs> jobs, musicians' jobs, authors' jobs. Some of the jobs that we feel are most meaningful as humans, what, why are we even thinking that this is a good thing to do? Shouldn't, it, shouldn't we be asking instead what is best for humanity and in terms of tech development, human cloning, and no, uh, let's not do that. We're replacing all the exciting jobs um, so we can have more boring jobs, no. I think this is a democracy question. We should ask ourselves, you know, what use of this tech is actually good for people? I think there are a lot of fantastic uses of AI. Let's figure out how to cure cancer, how to lift everybody out of poverty, how to have a sustainable environment, et cetera, et cetera. But just building these models because someone can make a buck off of it that eliminates m many of the things that give people meaning and, in and fuels income inequality, I think that's a net negative. Well, let me pluck a, a question out of that and build on it with uh, perhaps the other side of the coin by asking Robert about the subtitle of his book, What You Do That Artificial Intelligence Never Will. Can you help us out on that, Robert? Sure, I can. Uh, going back to Alan Turing in the 1930s, he proved that there were things and problems which are non-algorithmic. These are problems which are proven to not be uh, able to be executed by uh, computers. Since then, some of the great theoreticians such as Solomonoff and uh, Gregory Chaitin have added to this list, and we see that there are a lot of things which simply can't be computed. This begs the question, are there things which humans do which are non-computable? This was Roger Penrose's idea in The Emperor's New Mind, and, and this is where I, I learned about it, and he makes a very convincing, uh, convincing answer. So if there are non-algorithmic things, if there are non-algorithmic things that we do, they cannot be simulated by a computer. I would say the obvious ones are love, compassion, empathy, these sort of emotions. The more subtle ones are creativity, understanding, and sentience, when properly defined. Those look to be, in my mind thus far, non-algorithmic. All right, Melanie, let me give you an example here and get you to comment on this. Um, fear. Let's take an example of fear. You're in the country. You encounter a bear. As a human, you naturally experience fear. Your heart rate will skyrocket. The hairs on the back of your neck will stand up on end. The palms of your hands will get sweaty. You will have this flight reaction that will take place. If you were to describe this feeling, inevitably you will reference what's happening inside your body. Question, do we therefore need a body to feel fear? That's a great question. Uh, I don't think anyone knows the answer. I, you know, my, I feel like we do, yes, uh, but of course a lot of emotions take place in, in the brain and aren't necessarily, requ don't necessarily require body, all the body parts to, to, to uh, experience them. But I think that's a, the, the, one of the big questions of AI is like to how much do we need a body to really uh, have a full intelligence? How much is our intelligence uh, sort of specific to our particular kind of body? Do we need emotions to be intelligent? Is an intelligence separable from all these kinds of things? And I don't really know the answer, and I don't think anyone does. And this, you know, there's been a debate about this in the cognitive science world, in the AI world, and, you know, 
I think it's really an important question that we under try and understand this better. Computers now can't experience emotions. They don't have the kind of brains, if you will, or, or you know, sense, sensory apparatus to experience anything like human emotions. But what's needed for that? I don't think we know. And, you know, going back to what Robert said, the, he, he's assuming that um, a computer could never experience an emotion, even in principle. But I don't think that there's the evidence to support that yet. Robert, so you want it's to come really back on a that? scientific question. You want to come back on well, that, Robert? Well, I would say that there's no evidence that uh, AI has ever experienced an emotion. You can, you can, um, you can have the AI says, "I feel love." Uh, Lambda, in in the conversation with Blake Lemoyne, said, "You know." Um, what makes you what makes me happy being with family and just sitting around being with family come on that's that's something that it plagiarized from the net that it just borrowed um lambda has no family and so i i i i guess i reject the idea that emotions have been displayed by artificial intelligence to date okay max you want to take a kick at that yeah, I, I think even though it sounded like a big disagreement between Melanie and, and Robert, there really wasn't, because Robert is talking about AI up until now, and, and Melanie was saying in the future, she sees no reason why machines in principle couldn't do these things. I, I like the humility here, and I, I sh the Melanie articulated, I share it. I think plenty of things we don't know, but I think we also have to be humble in the sense of realizing that the, the, the space of, art of, of machine minds is vastly bigger than the kind of minds that, that we're familiar with and need not be anything like ours. I don't think you need to have a body to feel fear because I've had nightmares, which happened in my brain when my body wasn't involved at all. And uh, I also think that um, it's a mistake to say that we won't be able to figure out how to build very intelligent machines or consciousness machines just because we don't understand how our brains work. Because that's just like saying, hey, we're never going to figure out how to build airplanes until we first figure out how, how to build a mechanical bird. There's a TED Talk where you can see a mechanical bird actually working now, but that took 100 years longer than, than uh, <laughs> it took to build the airplane. And, 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 and there are much simpler ways of making flying machines. And I think in the same way, we're, gonna, we're seeing that there are much simpler ways of building thinking machines than um, that nature came up with, simply because nature had its hands tied. Nature had to figure out how to build a thinking machine on the constraint that it had to be able to assemble itself. And it had to also be able to do it out of just a handful of the most pot common atoms that are found in nature. And the engineers today, they don't have to worry about either of those two things. We still don't have a self-assembling computer, but we have, so, so I think we're gonna first figure out how we work actually by first building artificial minds and then have them help us figure out how the brain works. Okay, we're down to our last 30 seconds here. Robert, let me give it to you and ask the ethical question here. The fact that we maybe can do this doesn't answer the question of whether we should do this. Should we be building AI systems that might someday be conscious or super intelligent? I will tell you that unfortunately the smoke is out of the bottle and if if we don't do it in the United States it's going to be done somewhere else. There's lots of very high tech people that are very interested in in pursuing this and uh, I don't even think it's it's a question that we can answer. Gotcha. That's got to be the last word today, but certainly not the last word on this subject, to be sure. I want to thank Melanie Mitchell from the Santa Fe Institute, Robert J. Marks at Baylor University, Max Tegmark at MIT for an utterly fascinating conversation on one of the biggest issues around today. Thank you so much, you three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We humans have always gone to great lengths in the pursuit of happiness. Well, what if science could show you it's simpler and closer at hand than you might think? Dacher Keltner is a professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and faculty director of its Greater Good Science Center. His new book proposes just such a lab-backed recipe for the good life. It's called Awe, the new science of everyday wonder and how it can transform your life. 
And Dacker Keltner joins us now on the line from Berkeley, California. It's great to have you back. How are you doing? It's good to be with you, Steve. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Let's do an excerpt, uh, and then we shall uh, dive in, as we say. Sheldon, how'd you like to bring this graphic up? Nearly every day in classrooms of different kinds, from kindergarten circle rugs to lecture halls in Berkeley, from the apses of churches to inside prisons, from sterile conference rooms to gatherings in nature, I've taught people about finding the good life. What we are seeking in such inquiry is an answer to a perennial question, one we have been asking in different ways for tens of thousands of years. How can we live the good life? Now, 20 years into teaching happiness, I have an answer. Find awe. And for those listening on podcast, that's A-W-E, awe. And my first question to you, Dacker, is why awe? Yeah, awe is the feeling we experience when we encounter vast mysteries in the world. Uh, for example, we see a, an extraordinary tree or people dancing in unison or we hear a, a moving piece of music. And to, your, to answer your question, Steve, why awe? What this science of happiness has revealed just in the past 10 years that my book covers is awe is about as good for you as anything that you can do. It's good for your heart. It's good for your immune system. Uh, it helps you put your stresses in perspective. It helps elderly people feel less physical pain. It's good for your reasoning. So, you know, as I thought about this emergent new science of awe, uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book is to get this message out that this is really easy to find and it is very good for your mind and body. Well, let me follow up on that. Do you need to be at the top of the Rocky Mountains or in the <clears throat> depths of the Grand Canyon in order to experience it? Yeah, that was one of the most astonishing findings in this 10 years of research we've done, which is we call it everyday awe. Um, we surveyed people uh, every night for a couple of weeks in various countries like China and Japan and Spain and Canada and the United States. And what we found is people are feeling awe two to three times a week, you know, and they're feeling awe about, you know, as somebody told me recently in England, like catching the eyes of somebody on the tube and feeling a sense of common humanity or listening to the laughter of children or looking at the sky each day. So you don't need to travel much. You don't need to have a spiritual experience uh, to find everyday awe. It's, it's around us in very powerful ways. I am curious as to your reaction when you saw William Shatner, Captain Kirk, <laughs> land on the planet after having been in space. And, and clearly he was experiencing a kind of once in a lifetime awe. What did you make of it? Well, that's, you know, there are these classic moments of, of what you might call big awe. You know, everyday awe is more of the small variety. It's all around you if you just pause for a moment and, and reflect on, you know, what's mysterious about life. But, you know, these big awe experiences that Shatner experienced, um, you know, those are, are those are an important part of our lives. You know, one of my favorite examples, Steve, and you might even think about it for yourself is, you know, we have those kind of experiences at, at music events, for example. Mm -hmm. Most of us are like, we tear up, we get the goosebumps, we, we have this transcendent experience like Shatner had uh, coming to this planet. And it tells us something fundamental about why we're here. Um, have you had an experience like that of kind of profound awe at music? As you described it, every single time I hear Beethoven's Ninth, particularly if it's by the Toronto Symphony Orchestra at Roy Thompson Hall, by the time they get to the last note, I am a puddle. It's just such an <laughs> awe-inspiring thing. I, you know, you, you could cry. I mean, that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and people do routinely at music and those tears are really released by part of our nervous system that helps us be open to the world and engage with others. Um, and part of the message of the book is not only to think about everyday awe, but to return to the sources of big awe, like music, like big discoveries in Chatner's example that really tell us what our purpose or our meaning in life is. Well, let me let me get you to share an experience that that is kind of off the path of what you just <clears throat> described. It yeah. was it was huge, obviously, but it was also tragic, and it's not what we traditionally think of as an awe-inspiring moment. But perhaps you could go into that, and I refer, of course, to the death of your brother. Yeah, thank you, um, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I, I had a, an extraordinary childhood with my younger brother Rolf, who was one year younger than me, and you know we grew up in uh, you know, the late 60s in Laurel, Can Laurel Canyon, where there's a lot of music, born in Mexico, then moved to the country, swam in rivers, climbed mountains. We had an awe-inspired brotherhood. And then um, he got colon cancer, 
and passed away after two years. And it was brutal. Um, and, you know, that is a, a very hard cancer. Um, and what struck me, Steve, and it actually led me to write this book, is I had been preparing for his passing. I knew he, was, he had a couple of months. Uh, I was reading up on how to sort of grieve when you lose somebody who is your brother, uh, as close as he was. And that night, watching him leave this world, my family and I were around him. We were touching him. Uh, I looked at him, and he seemed at peace with the world. Um, he seemed to be moving into some other space uh, that I couldn't understand. We all were in reverence of his being, if you will. And I'm a, a biological evolutionary scientist. and. I had no way to make sense of the awe that I felt watching him pass. It is a huge mystery. What is life and why do people we love go? And it really sent me on, a, on this mission, right? To I lost my sense of awe during grief. I, I was really struggling. I returned to the things that bring me awe, like mountains and music and you know, people who inspire me, even in prisons. Um, and to really recapture what my brother had meant to me in my life. Uh, and I learned a lot along the way about how awe helps us even in the hardest of times. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I know, for example, you know, fear, anger, yeah. disgust, surprise, these things have all been studied at great length by numerous academics and scientists and so on. Awe has not. Why do you suppose? Yeah, yeah you know, it's it's so extraordinary because People like Descartes and Darwin and um, Aristotle really felt that awe or our capacity for wonder, like Jane Goodall, the great primatologist, was just our, our most human emotion. Um, and yet, science really hadn't studied it. And I think that, you know, part of it is it sounds more serious to be studying fear than awe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and scientists are a little bit defensive, right? About, and then part of it is that awe touches upon things that are really hard to define and even measure scientifically, like the sublime or the sacred or spirit, right? People often talk about spirituality with awe, but we've made a lot of progress in figuring out how to study this miraculous emotion, to find what its benefits are, um, and, and it's now a very fruitful area of inquiry in our field. Hmm. Awe is a feeling, as you define it, quote, that transcends your current understanding of the world. And I wonder if, in some strange way, that's a bit problematic because, of course, we very much want to understand our world. It makes us feel safer if we understand yeah. our world. So why do we need awe? Yeah, well, we, you know, and what a, an astute comment because it is this paradox of awe that awe happens when we see things we can't make sense of or hear things we can't make sense of. And we cry and we get goosebumps and we feel small and feel like we're disappearing and, and feel connected to things that are vast. So why would we have an emotion that really uh, is really at the heart about uncertainty and the fallibility or, or limits of our knowledge? And I think for two reasons we have awe, um, Steve, and, and they're really important today. The first is a little, it, it'll sound a little arcane or academic, but it's to help us understand that we're connected to large systems in the world, that we are part of cultures and families and musical groups and traditions and ecosystems and big ideas. We care about big ideas. Awe relates us to all these big things in the world. When people feel awe, they will say things like, oh, now I understand who are my people or what is my home or how I'm really part of the ecosystem and not an owner of the ecosystem. Awe opens our minds up out of this narrow focus we're so often lost in to broader patterns in the world that we're part of. And then the second one is really simple, which is that in the course of our evolution, we became a very social species, a very collective species. And awe, more than any experience, makes us realize that we are part of community, that we're part of collective. Even when you go out in the beauties of Canada, right, the Rockies or the forests or the oceans, and you have an experience of awe, you will walk out of that experience in nature feeling like, I actually have a lot of good community around me. And, and when we think about the epidemic of loneliness right now, 40% of Americans feel too lonely. Awe is an antidote through that sense of community. It is an antidote, but since you're on the issue of sort of how we think evolutionarily <clears throat> speaking, right. we, we certainly understand why we evolutionarily speaking have anger or fear right. or, I mean, all right. of that makes sense. 
Where does awe fit into that puzzle? It, it's profoundly important, you know, and, and there are, it's pretty much a consensus now in the evolutionary world. You know, E.O. Wilson, the social conquest of Earth from humans. We, we do better in facing evolutionary threats to our survival collectively, right? Think about the climate crises and how we really need to, to bond together collectively. Awe makes us connected to others. We cooperate, we share, and the like. Um, and then awe is an incredible engine of the development of knowledge. And I'm really worried that we're losing awe out of the schools when in fact, and I write about this, a lot of the greatest discoveries in art and music and science and literature came out of experiences of awe. Rene Descartes and um, Isaac Newton were awestruck by rainbows. <laughs> you know, they're like, how in the world do rainbows exist? How is it that light bends through water and then produces the color spectrum? And so they did some of their best math and physics to figure it out. And then time and time again, and in our own lives, awe helps us advance our understanding of the world, which is very good for our evolution. Well, since you've raised culture, let's stay with that. And again, we'll pluck yeah. a, a quote out of the book here. You write, awe animates the stories, ceremonies, rituals, and visual designs of indigenous people dating back tens of thousands of years. You might think of these as our first awe technologies. How so? <laughs> yeah. Well, if awe has all these benefits, right, it, it makes me more modest, less egoistic, more calm, less stress, stronger immune system, et cetera. You would imagine that cultures would create ways to evoke awe in us, much like, you know, laughter is good for us and we have comedies throughout the cultural traditions and jesters and fools and so forth. And, you know, once you have that thesis and you, you start looking at culture, as I write about, you know, like you said, you know, Steve, the Beethoven was a lot about awe hmm. to bring people together in the experience of awe. Many of the visual patterns of the indigenous societies of Mesoamerica have a lot of sort of activation of awe in them for the benefits of awe, right? Um, you, I was raised, my dad, by a painter, and my mom taught literature, ironically enough, poetry from Romanticism, which is about awe. And those cultural forms bring us awe, as does religion. So you can think about we, us creating culture to just activate this emotion that makes us better members of our community. If you're going to bring us back to Beethoven, I'm going to ask another question about Beethoven, and that is this. <laughs> I get, well, when somebody's standing on the top of the Rocky Mountains and they see that vista for the first and maybe only time in their lives, it can have an awe-inspiring impact. I've yeah. heard Beethoven's ninth probably 50 to yeah. 100 times, and yet it has the same impact every time. How come? Yeah. You know, you've just put your finger on, on one of the, I think, one of the mysterious and magical properties of awe. Pleasures, the more we experience many realms of pleasure, the less pleasurable it becomes, right? Um, you know, you, you, you buy some new shoes, they're pleasurable, you enjoy their sensory experience, their sen sensory appearance, and then they diminish in their pleasure, and that's uh, called the law of hedonic adaptation. But awe doesn't operate that way. And in fact, our research suggests that the more, like you, Steve, you know, the more that you go after what you really will find awe in, the richer it gets, the more powerful mm -hmm. it gets. You know, uh, in California, we have a lot of uh, fungi and tree enthusiasts who just love the science of fungi and trees. And the more they dive into it, the richer and more powerful and awe eliciting it becomes. So what a great property of this wonderful human emotion, awe is that the more we learn about it, the more we pursue it, the more it gives to us. Amen, brother. Okay, well, speaking of amen, brother, how about religion? Could we have religion yeah. today without awe? Yeah, I, th I think we could, and, and you know, but I think, uh, you know, it was such an interesting thing. We've found in 26 countries that there are universals to the sources of awe, like nature and moral beauty and music. And also religion, very obviously. It's a human universal to believe in the divine. And uh, there are certain theorists who really were animated by your question and made the case that awe is the core to religion. Uh, Emile Durkheim, the great French sociologist, felt it was about moving in unison when we're singing together, doing the rituals of religions, right? That brings us into 
uh, a movement together of to togetherness that just produces this ecstatic awe feeling. That's our sense of the divine. And then William James, uh, the great American philosopher in the, in the early 1900s, made the same case uh, following Ralph Waldo Emerson that at its core, religion is about these self-transcendent emotions, bliss, awe, joy, love of humanity, where the self dissolves and you devote yourself to service and to other people and to the divine. And, and there are a lot of interesting new lines of thinking that awe is probably the, the central religious emotion, as you suggest. Hmm. Let me ask about impediments to awe. And to that yeah. end, we'll look at ideology. Ideology, yeah. people who are particularly ideological are very rigid in their views. They are not open yeah. to, necessarily open to persuasion by others. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of them believe they've got all the answers and so on. Everything is black and yeah. white. So I, I guess the question is, is ideology an impediment to experiencing awe? It is. I mean, and what a deep observation. I wish I'd written about that. <laughs> you know, you think about the polarization of our times, preventing, which is driven by ideology and misperception, you know, being an impediment to the awe we might feel towards some a fellow citizen of Canada or U.S. who's really different from us, but there is a common humanity there. And, and ideology, and I would argue, Steve, and there are data on this more generally, more rigid patterns of thought where it's either or, yes or no, right, are impediments to awe. You know, if you, for example, we've been talking about music, and if you really go into experiences in music and just say, it's only Bach, he's the only one that matters, then, and everybody else is secondary, you will miss out on the opportunities of awe in other musical composers, right? Same with films and, and um, you know, moral forms of moral beauty. If, if you really think of it in very rigid ideological circumscribed terms, you will miss a, a, as a general tendency, all the awe that's around us in things you ordinarily wouldn't perceive. So hmm. it's a, a real risk today. You look far and wide to find some great stories about people who've experienced yeah. awe. And I'm not surprised to see that Steve Kerr is in your book. Uh, Steve yeah. Kerr, of course, having played with Michael Jordan for the Chicago Bulls and now having coached the Golden State Warriors to, to championships, multiple championships as well. He's had a few awe-inspiring moments in his life. But mm. if someone wants to... Okay, if we all can't be like Mike, where do we look for awe in the daily routine of life? Yeah. that and Ultimately, that's the question, you know, in some sense, is... But in a, and I'll remind our, our listeners and viewers and audience members, you know, Einstein really felt that awe is really what brings life to being a human being. And I agree. And so that begs the question, how do I find it? You know, and, and what I would say is the following, you know, if you go outside today, um, there are simple practices you can do, like an awe walk that we've tested where you walk more slowly and look for mystery, watch the clouds, Stand near a tree and think about its age for a while. Look to the sky. Nature is part of awe. Uh, fellow human beings are remarkable sources of awe once you open your eyes. You know, uh, I loved the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard's quote that he loved to walk in public places like Toronto and just open yourself up to the humanity of others, right? How they're coordinating and laughing and engaged in social in interactions because it, it brought him into contact with what he called the significance of insignificant things. There's so much awe around us in our fellow human beings, their generosity, their courage, their humor, and the like. And then I really think that, you know, I'm, I appreciate you bringing up culture and, and that quote of, you know, rituals and poems and pieces of music. Listen more intentionally to music for all. Um, consider, you know, uh, having a, a, a week of binging on awe-based movies or, or, or streamed episodes, right? Uh, and then if you're contemplatively or spiritually oriented, you know, orient toward vastness and mystery in your, your contemplative practice. So in the book, you will get a sense of all these simple things to do right now um, that bring us all. Hmm. Did you come to a conclusion as to whether we find awe more frequently, or it finds us more frequently. <laughs> well put. Uh, yeah, I think it's. I think. Uh, 
I think it's the latter in general that it catches us off guard and suddenly we're, you know, like the, the fellow in England who told me, you know, literally tearing up. He's like, I was on the tube here and I made eye contact with this person who offered some money to another individual. And I just, we just were in reverence for that moment. And it happened to him. And I think emotions often uh, are involuntary and happen to us. But, you know, we're very good at cultivating awe. We're very good at putting a little awe into your daily practice or into your calendar. In fact, at the Greater Good Science Center, we, in December, we created an awe calendar where you can go find mm -hmm. awe twice a week, you know, just with simple practices, easy to get to, greatergood.berkeley.edu. Um, and so I think it's, I think it happens to us, but life is about being a little bit more intentional in finding awe. Well, let's finish up on this. Can I assume that keeping your nose in one of these things 24 seven is not the path to finding awe? No, you know, and Steve, we surveyed and interviewed people in 26 countries, what brings them awe, you know, from Canada to Mexico, to India, to Japan, to Russia, to the United States, to Brazil. Not a single human being mentioned a smartphone. Not a single human being mentioned their laptop, <laughs> nor a Google search, right? These, these are our mediums to get to awe, and I think we've lost sight of that. And I think we need to remember, and we need to remind our, our people in the digital world to start designing for awe. Bottom line, people, get your nose out of your phones and take a look around you. Exactly. Gotcha. Uh, I can't thank you enough for this awesome interview, if I can steal a word there. Uh, Dacher Keltner is uh, the professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the author, author most recently of Awe, the new science of everyday wonder and how it can transform your life. And we're always delighted to welcome him back to TVO. Thanks so much, Dacher. Steve, it's always great to be in conversation with you. Hope for the next time. That is the agenda for Tuesday, February 14th, 2023. Fresh off this past weekend's Super Bowl betting frenzy, tomorrow we'll ask if wagering on sports has gone too far. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.